More than 100 countries have agreed to a United Nations treaty to conserve and ensure the sustainable use of the world's oceans. The High Seas Treaty is the result of 10 years of negotiations and aims to designate 30% of international waters as protected areas by the end of the decade. The agreement was reached after marathon talks at the UN headquarters in New York. The treaty puts limits on how much fishing, shipping activity, mining and exploration can take place in those protected areas. Your hard work, your dedication, your commitment um, to wanting to make this a success is the reason why we are here today. You know, in Singapore, we like to, um, we like to go on learning journeys. Um, our children don't go on excursions, they go on learning journeys. And I can safely say that this has been the learning journey of a lifetime. Well, Minna Epps is the director of the Oceans Team at the International Union for Conservation and Nature. She's been closely involved in those negotiations, and I'm delighted to say she joins us now. So thank you very much indeed uh, for being here with us today. This is, appears to be a very big achievement. Uh, why is this agreement so important and necessary? Can you give us a sense of the current state of the world's oceans? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It is indeed a historical moment. Um, the ocean, or what this treaty is about, also called the High Seas Treaty, is about the high seas. And the high seas is basically uh, two, thir uh, sorry, two thirds of our ocean. So that's about 64% of the ocean is considered the high seas. And that means that it's uh, beyond national jurisdiction. So each state or other state has um, uh, an exclusive economic zone, which is about 200 nautical miles. So everything outside of that is considered the high seas. And we are no, learning much more now how important the role, um, the role of the ocean, both in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, so the ocean has been under tremendous threat from plastic pollution and overfishing. So, and also very stressed by climate change implications. So the ocean has absorbed um, as much as between 25 to 40% uh, depending on how you count the excessive CO2 emission. So the uh, ocean is becoming sour, more acidic. It is also um, the, the becoming deoxygenated, so less oxygen. So all these uh, factors actually have an impact on the ocean health and ultimately our own health as it has declined. So we need the ocean for its, uh, the, the species, the ecosystem to really remain intact, to be productive and continue to provide services and benefits to humankind, both in food security, uh, climate change mitigation adaptation. So it's, it's really needed for, for biodiversity protection and climate action. And why has this treaty failed before now? And what are the key sticking points of the treaty? Yeah, so what this treaty really is trying to do is really to fill some of the legal gaps. So really that you can have um, a whole, um, um, you know, management and a legal framework and mechanism to really manage the, the ocean as a whole and it's uh, and the human activities that happens in the ocean. So um, it has taken a very long time. It's, I would say it's been in discussion for nearly two decades and negotiated for about five. And it's because multilateralism is difficult. It's 193 states that come together and needs to agree on a various amount of issues. It is, for example, how to establish area-based management tools in terms of marine protected areas, creating a mechanism for that, but also to um, uh, how, look at marine genetic resources, the access and benefit sharing, and uh, then the capacity building that's needed, but also to be able to do environmental impact assessment to make sure that no uh, sector or a, a, a human activity taking place in the high seas has negative environmental impact. I would say that in this context, um, what has been discussed from the very beginning has been on fisheries, uh, whether it's included or not included, but also lately um, towards the final hours, it was really a lot about marine genetic resources and the access and benefit, uh, uh, benefit sharing of these resources. Um, so I would say that. So it's about, you know, being fair and equitable agreement um, that is, again, still future proof. So I would say that that has been um, the key um, issues. Mm. And as you said, multilateralism, very difficult. Uh, how will it work then in practice? Who will enforce adherence in these vast areas of the ocean that will now be protected? 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think that this, this treaty is an internationally legally binding treaty. It will come into force when uh, 60 states, I believe, um, uh, has ratified it. And within that treaty, there's a lot of uh, some, uh, you know, different uh, sections on monitoring compliance, what kind of mechanism, how are decision being made, etc. And a lot of those details in terms of the actual mechanism or the modalities will be established by the conference of parties. So there's still a lot of, of these kind of mechanisms that still needs to be decided how they're going to actually work in practice. So these are the legal aspects of it. And then the different modalities and mechanism and frameworks will have to be decided um, uh, later on um, by the conference of parties. All right, well, Minna Epps, director of the Oceans team at the IUCN. Thank you very much indeed for your thoughts today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.